So welcome back to the second part of the final Road to Paris session uh, in preparation for the Red Bull Music Academy in Paris later this year. And our guest right now is someone we should give a very big welcome to. This is Gilbert, uh, the guy behind the incredibly influential Versatile Records and someone with kind of two decades worth of influence in music. So a very big welcome, please, Gilbert. So can we start by talking about Versatile Records, the label you started and that you've been running for 18 years now? Uh, yes, we can, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Merci bien. Um, where would you say your label is right now? Because the label's developed a lot over time, hasn't it? Yes, it developed all the time and I, um, I kept interesting into new music and mm -hmm. basically that's the music that kept me interesting into releasing stuff. So I try to get myself entertained with some new stuff and also discovering some new stuff and try to relate them. And I call the label like that because my vision of music was as one part and I didn't want it to be, uh, to release one kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the first two releases we had were quite big into what they call the, the French touch, some mm -hmm. kind of filter disco stuff. And as a first release, I made something different just to show to the people I wanted to release some different kind of stuff, which is sometimes an advantage and sometimes a disadvantage because uh, people don't, don't really know what to expect, which I like. Mm -hmm. But this French touch you mentioned, which I think generally in the UK we talked, you know, we called French house the late 90s into the early 2000s. You know, you were an important part of that world. You know, you released early records by Daft Punk, mm -hmm. Pepe Braddock, mm -hmm. all those guys. But what you're saying is from the very beginning, even though it might have seemed like part of this musical world, you always wanted it to be broad and versatile. Mm -hmm. So what's the question? Is that the case? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that right from the very beginning, even though it seemed very much associated with one type of music, that the intention was always to be broad. Yeah, because it just happened like that. I don't know why. Like uh, we discovered some kind of funk or disco record, and also I think music is very related to technology. How music sounds is related to technology, and at that time, so it was '96, like was the sampler stuff and with some some filter, yeah, function. And basically, I think yeah, we all had fun with with this at at first in a very naive way, and that's that's how it came out. Yeah. So before we kind of go back in time and talk about that era, can we hear something from the label right now? One of your more recent releases, maybe? Yeah, I can play you the... Etienne Jaume. Yeah, okay. So maybe for people who... We can talk about it afterwards. It's a long intro.
it's, it's quite long, and I'm not going to play it all. It has to, do, to be developed. <laughs> Actually, like Jaume, it's, it's, it's a funny example because this guy uh, doesn't come at all from the, the dance music scene. He, he comes more from the indie scene. And he doesn't even work with a computer. He, he sequences everything. He has an 808 drum machine who gives the clock. And this is his second album. But the first album, I asked Carl Craig to produce it. And when I came to him, I said, yeah, I play the music to, to Carl. And uh, yeah, he's, he's up to produce it. And he said to me, like, who? Uh, <laughs> So it's really, he has an approach of the, of the music. It's not very on that track. It's just more like kind of taking the thing, but very, um, yeah, very unique, very particular, and, uh, and not coming at all from the, the dance music. So on the label, basically, it's a group of people who re all really into music, but all, all of us, we come from a, a different, uh, different genre, different, different kind of stuff, but we all fit together, actually. So we had uh, Ivan Smag on the couch yesterday, mm -hmm. and he was talking about how in France there's often a very big separation between the kind of tribes of music maybe we were talking about before, and that if you're in the kind of more rock or indie or guitar-based side of things, you're just rarely going to be interested in like what you might broadly call dance music. Is that still the case in France? No, not at all. And even for a long time, it was very difficult to get some uh, big DJ to come in Paris. And uh, the, the, the night scene was a bit slow for quite some time. And since the last four or five years, it completely changed into something very heavy. Um, we have some very big parties and also some kind of collective, like uh, it makes me think like, like back in the day in the, in the rave scene, like some, some kids from 20, uh, 20 year old uh, um, take a venue somewhere a bit illegal and have 2,000 people there. So, and it tends really to, yeah, to mix now. So these raves that are happening in France now. Sorry? Th these, ra these big parties that you're talking about in a warehouse, are they happening in France now? Yes, they are. Yeah. So can you like, paint us a picture? What kind of things are happening in these parties? What music's being played? All kinds of stuff. Like uh, At the moment, it's mainly house music, because there is also funny to see this big 90s uh, house revival. Uh, so yeah, it's mainly those kind of stuff. It, also, the funny thing is sometimes the DJ are completely unknown. And you have a lot of people to to go there. I think it's also a response to uh, the clubs, where the drinks are very expensive. There is many rules, and for a kid uh, of 20, uh, maybe he doesn't have like 12 euros to uh, to buy a vodka or whatever. So there is much cheaper, and there is a good sound system. There is uh, much m more freedom for everything, basically. So I think that's why it's, uh, it's booming right now. And is there any overlap with the hip hop scene in France? Because there's a, a, a huge kind of hip-hop world in the country. Is, is there any kind of overlap between those two worlds? Yeah, but it doesn't interest me much because uh, with the difference of the United States, for example, uh, when they produce hip-hop, they really prop they properly produce it and uh, I really like how it sounds. It's a bit also futuristic and uh, production-wise also uh, uh, kind of lesson. And where in France, the, I think the, the hip-hop guys, they, they just want to make some hits and uh, the way they produce music doesn't really appeal to me, at least now. So this kind of 90s house revival that's happening in France, and I guess is also the case elsewhere, how, is that, how does that show itself? Is that to do with the, the records people are playing or the kind of like uh, music people are making? Where is that revival showing itself? Well, I think it's... Uh, people want to, um, to have... I think in the 90s, the way house music was done was very fresh and very instinctive and uh, is a bit naive. And I think there is this, this will to come back to this kind of lost way to produce music. I think that's why it's so appealing right now. But me, as I've been there in the 90s, it's a bit sometimes difficult to play them again because I played them when they were released. I wanted to ask you about a different project you're involved with at the moment, the, um, what's it called, the Dripping... Uh, dripping and tripping release on Honest John's that DJ. Ah yes, so from DJ sort of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe can you tell guys, tell these guys about what it was and and what your involvement in it is. Yeah, with, with sort of it, Stefan is a is, is a guy very amazing. He has a label called Sex Tags Mania, and it, so it's he's half Austrian, half from Norway, and so he runs his label really by himself in a DIY way, and uh, he releases all kind of stuff. Is very yeah, trippy and very psychedelic kind of thing. And uh, I met him in Paris once. I, I booked him for a party. 
And he told me, yeah, okay, I'm keen to come, but I'd like to stay in your place for three days and we make music. So I said, wow. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so <laughs> Invite so yourself. I say, why not? You know? uh -huh. And so we did. And uh, yeah, and it was a big chance to, uh, because it's not often uh, when you work with someone in the studio that magic happens and something's going on. And with him, it was really the case. So we did two 12 inches on Versatile. And this one is more like a kind of cop kind of thing where I invited many people to, uh, to do stuff. And the track we have on uh, this uh, Honest Jones release, basically I was in Berlin to play and I had a track I made and couldn't go really till the end. So I said, yeah, like maybe you can help me to, let's jam, let's jam it, you know? And, uh, and we did, we did for two hours and he recorded everything and that's, I don't, actually I don't have it here because this guy is a kind of a vinyl ayatollah, you know? And, uh, <laughs> So I don't even have the file, <laughs> and I don't have the record, I'm sorry, but I can play some other stuff I made with him. It was a very interesting uh, meeting. Yeah. Maybe we should, we should hear something you do have that you recorded with him, or maybe his yeah, release yeah. on Versus. Also, it's 15 minutes, the track, yeah. I won't play it all. But, but <laughs> while, you're finding it, while you're finding it, maybe can you tell us the process of how you turn two hours of jamming into a, a sort of single tune? Uh, so this track is called Cobra, and for this track, also it was more or less the same process. Basically, it was some, some scratch I had from, uh, from a track I've done before. And we just recorded some stuff. I was playing some stuff. And at the same time, uh, he was uh, structuring the track, which is a very uh, interesting way to, to work, if I can find the track. Um, yeah. And on and on, it's 15 minutes like that. Yeah. 
So when you jam for two hours and you have this kind of recording of what you're doing, how do you then turn that into 10 minutes or 15 minutes of music? That's when the difficult part, at least to me, comes. That's why I like to work with other people uh, because I like to have idea recording stuff. But uh, Stefan is very good to get focused. And as you said, like it's also very important when you do something to to achieve it and to finish it. And it's, mm. I think, yeah, it's the most difficult. And as you said, it, a, a, a good track or any idea comes the first 10 minutes. The rest is really more uh, um, laborious in France. I don't know how to say, mm. but like- Laborious. So, yeah, yeah, it's like we have to to really bring it to the end, uh, especially structure-wise and then after uh, mix-wise. Mm-hmm. How you put sounds in space, uh, which kind of effects you give them, how they arrive. Mm-hmm. So basically, in there, uh, it, it was done this, like, on the spot, basically. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, it, the, the track was done while we were recording it. Like, we finished the day, and the track was, was done. Mm-hmm. And for the other one, after, it's Stefan that came back and listened and edit, and, uh, which is good, but uh, it's not my, uh, my best part, I would say. <laughs> so for you, really, the creative process is mostly about just kind of doing it, capturing something and then finessing it afterwards. Yes, and the, the, proce- the, the, the process really changed to me uh, since I started to do music, into sitting in front of the computer and look at cubes and repeat parts and stuff like that, into now like uh, more jamming the, the, the track, record it, and sometimes can jam it for one hour or two, or two and then I, I prefer to edit after that. So I really have the, have the vibe of me like, uh, moving some faders, sending some effects on the mixer and kind of, yeah, more like a kind of live feel into the production. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you've worked with lots of different people. You, you worked with iCube for a long time at Chateau Flight. Mm-hmm. You've collaborated with lots of different people. Mm-hmm. What for you is the hallmark of a successful collaboration? Uh, what do you mean uh, till, till now? I, I guess mean, uh, I mean, how do you know if it's going to work? I think it's, 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 it's evident in a way. When, when the studio, something is good, and it's just evident that why, s- sometimes there is a, when you work with some people, there is some ego. For example, a, a guy say, yeah, okay, I play that chord, so it's good. So sometimes people like fight a bit to have their ideas in the track. But what, to me, the, what, the, what I like and the people I work with, the good idea is imposed by itself. Like, uh, it's just happened like that, and it's also very good to leave it on and not to put egos at all into into that process. Mm. I guess some people here might already be working other people, or maybe they're working by themselves and haven't yet started collaborating. What would be your advice, maybe, if you're at the beginning of of that experience? How how do you go into a collaboration in the right way? Well, just leave the idea, even if it sounds crazy, even if it sounds weird. Uh, just let, let it go and uh, don't stick to any, anything. Just uh, have fun, basically. It's about to have fun in the studio. That's it. Mm-hmm. So the, the Chateau Flight stuff, which we just mentioned, is kind of on hold at the moment, isn't it? Because you and iCube are both doing separate things. What's he up to and what are you up to? With, with a human. At the moment, it's, uh, we collaborate for a very long time, and after a while, like Nicolas Icub, he wanted to get back to his own stuff, and he also moved from Paris to Roma, so we had a kind of break uh, working together. Mm-hmm. So the latest stuff we released was a Terry Riley cover project, and uh, yeah, and we still want to do some stuff, but it also allows me to do other things. Also him to produce his M Mega Mix album was released uh, last year. And yeah, now he's really the guy. He's, I can play you some new stuff. He's, he's really on fire, basically. Like, yeah, uh, let's working. have a little listen. Yeah, okay. So, so this is going to be... Uh, we can, can play these two, yeah. So it's a, it's a beat, a beat track. There is no bass line, it's only a beat.
So this is going to be out on Running Back. It's not my label. It's uh, from Gerd Johnson label. And um, this other one will release uh, very soon. Uh, so this one's going to be forthcoming on your label? For Running Back. Let me find the other one and I played it out. This is not the one. That is like a that is a rave record. Yeah, it's, it's very bleep, as you mentioned, very Sheffield influence kind of. This so is a new thing from iCube. This is the next one. Uh -huh. yeah, it's released at the end of the month. So, are you hearing this music being played out at the warehouse parties that you were talking about earlier? Is music you mean? This this like this this record. Uh, yeah, for for brave DJ that could be yeah. And so, have you been playing that out? What? Have you been playing that out? Yes, a lot. Yeah. So, what happens when you play that record? How? What happens when you play that record? <laughs> People like it. <laughs> <laughs> if I drop it in the right moment. <laughs> so what is the right moment to play that record at a rave? At a I would play it like in the, the beginning of the set, maybe as a, as a second or third track. I think it's nice. I like the, the tempo. It's, it's slow, but still it's, it's heavy bass and heavy beats too. So it's not too... Uh, I, what I like in this guy he really has the two things I really like in the music, which is like the the, the space, the, the psychedelic kind of thing, but also beat wise and bass bass wise very heavy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're a DJ really who's kind of known for, I suppose, flying the, the versatile flag very heavily in terms of playing very broad types of music. Mm -hmm. I guess some people may have seen you, they may have seen the Boiler Room Paris set that you did, uh, mm -hmm. like 
was like about a year ago, maybe. Yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but maybe if people haven't seen that, can you give them a sense of what they would hear if they came to see you DJ? A lot of stuff, basically some disco, some techno, some house, some sometimes some synth wave, some uh, some reggae, sometimes maybe some drum and bass if I play long, you know. Like uh, I like to. I'm not the type DJ at all who play one type of sound. It's something I don't know how to do. Like to make some very slow building and then some breaks and. So me, I like the accidents. I like to bring people everywhere, and uh, which is sometimes difficult because uh, as a DJ, it requires a lot of energy to get the people, and sometimes you can lose them when you play the wrong, the wrong tune. But yeah, that's the way I, I have fun playing. Otherwise, I think that would be depressing for me, like yeah. to <laughs> not to do that. I know that you you know you play all over the place. I know that you played as part of the closing parties for the Trow Club in Amsterdam, which is a kind of very famous Dutch club, a, a kind of dirty old warehouse. Um, but I thought it was quite cool because rather than just having like a closing night, they had like a closing season almost, didn't they, where they asked everybody who'd played at the club to come back and do their, their final trowel set. What was yours like? Me, for the first time, I played how many times? That, that, that last time I played downstairs, which is very filthy and, uh, and raw and dark uh, <laughs> place, which I like. <laughs> because upstairs, it tends to be very also formulatic uh, kind of music with basically some beats, some break, some stab, and some beat again. But downstairs, you can really play whatever you like. Plus, as a DJ, it's great because the sound system is amazing. They give you the choice of the mixer. Yeah. So I asked for some rotative mixer, and then you can really get into it when the sound is so good. Basically, I have the feeling I'm, I'm riding a big truck, and uh, I can play whatever <laughs> I like. <laughs> so why that mixer? Why that mixer in particular that you chose? Why? Why that mixer? Uh, because uh, the rotative way to play music. Uh, I used to play a lot of hip hop, and I used to be a lot in some cut and stuff like that, but not anymore. Now I'm more into blending stuff together, and with this type of mixer, you can really make it in the smooth way, and uh, yeah, that's why I like it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if we were to be in your studio, what would we be seeing around us? What, what do you have in your studio? What's your setup? Uh, many old stuff, some a few drum machines, but not too much. Uh, and we don't have 808 or 909. I used to have one, but uh, many synths because uh, synthesizer to me. It's, they have very character, and I also like the way that there is knobs and uh, and function that you can play live with. And basically, I have, for example, my main piece is a Juno 60, and I use it since uh, since the beginning. And I yeah, I can't get get rid of it. Like uh, you always have some so much combination with the synth itself, and also when you're messing around messing around with some FX. You, you can also have the sound completely different. So it's also about fun, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And have you had a kind of technical discovery recently? Have you discovered a process or a piece of hardware or a program or a, a trick that you've discovered recently? No, not really. Just like before, I was working with Cubase. And when Ableton came, to me, it was very fit to, to me, in a way, because it was very... For example, in Cubase, to change the tempo, and I used to work with samples, it was really a trance, like uh, really a pain in the ass to, to do that. And suddenly, it became very simple to to mix some intuitive way of doing music. Uh, and at the same time, yeah, being into, able to coming back to it and to make it even more better. So, so yeah. See, to me, as a software, that would be this even. It's, yeah, it's, everyone uses it, but yeah, I reckon for me, that, that does it. I just regret a bit the sound sometimes when you put too much ch channels. I think the sound, it changed a bit. It becomes a, a bit blurred. So that's why we I keep like a, a mixer. And I o always work with a, with a mixer because I like to have a physical effect on the, on the channels, on the affix and stuff like that. Yeah. Taking it back to uh, the music you released just for one minute, um, you've been uh, putting out a lot of reissues, including some re-edits of old disco records. You know, you were just talking about liking to kind of DJ in a disco way. 
Um, but I wondered if you could tell us a bit about the Disco Reedit kind of project that you did and what it is for you that makes a good reissue. I think when nobody knows it. Uh, so this, this compilation release called Disco Sympathy uh, is from a guy called Vidal Benjamin and this guy is a lawyer and he's, he's in life. But he has a patient to go on flea market every weekend with his Fisher Price thing. And basically his policy and is to not to buy a record over five euros. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's mainly like some, some shit stuff, some very obscure stuff. But he managed to find some amazing music mm -hmm. that I would compare to B, B movies. And like, uh, it was like the B disco funky stuff from the 80s and uh, it was also funny to because we cleared all the all the tracks and so we have been to look out to the people and s most of them they've been like one seven inch in the 80s because yeah it was a it was a big thing and some of them has, has became i don't know writing music for uh, um, comedy musical like uh, where people sing like uh, i don't know in english the world some were working like post office some uh, so it was also funny to see the, the, the trajectory of all these people and uh, yeah shall i play one uh, one yes, one track yes, so this is an edit I, i've done with uh, vidal benjamin Yeah, so it's some stuff like that, some very sweet, like a, like a candy kind of thing. Yeah. So was there quite a pop aspect to a certain type of French disco then? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, totally. Like a, I like this idea of people making a seven inch and they would think they would be a star of the, of the moment, you know, but most of the time it never happened. You know? <laughs> so it's a kind of, yeah, big, like an untold story of uh, the French culture in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so these guys, when you, you know, you said that they'd ended up in some very different places, you know, working in the post office or actually making music. Uh, was there any particular story that really stood out for you about how they responded when they were contacted about, about this project? Yeah, there were, most of them were amazed, like, yeah, why well, you, you, I have done this 20 years ago, and uh, yeah, I, I think it was... Uh, 
and we made a release party and actually we we invite some of them oh. and it was yeah it was really touching and re very fun and uh, now I have, I have this guy called Johnny Resch and I think it's his real name uh, uh, so he called me and I said, yeah, please send me some more. Maybe it could, it could be played in radio in Cannes and stuff like that. So yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of into it, yeah. <laughs> and it's quite different from the other reissue that you've done recently from the guy from former Yugoslavia. Yeah, it's not, it's, this is not, I can play some, but it's not, this is the next project. And what, that's what I like to run my label because basically I can do this and I can reissue. So this Rex Illusive, which is completely in a different story. So this guy has been, has been introduced to me by uh, Vladimir Evkovich, which is the resident DJ of uh, Salon des Amateurs, which is an amazing club in Dusseldorf. So if you go to Dusseldorf, go there. It's a little, it's probably like the third of the, of the place, but they play the most crazy, odd music uh, ever. And uh, this guy like, is really a like, serious collector. And so he, he found this guy called Rex Illusivi, who basically, made music all his life, but never released almost nothing. Uh, and he moved to Brazil in 92, and he died in Brazil in uh, 99, uh, in the fire of his studio. And he just released some Bebel Gilberto thing, which was like a big thing in Brazil. So basically just arrived to make something that, that worked. And after the release party, went to the studio and trying to get stuff out of the studio in the fire, he just died there. And so Vladimir made this long work to uh, be to Belgrade to meet to meet uh, his mother, some friends, and and it was like an, an incredibly mass amount of uh, of music from the 80s to the to the 90s, and it's to me it sounds it's like he found a treasure. Like uh, shall we play something? So yeah, like a lost genius. Exactly, mm. and also I, I actually like uh, heard a new also reissue. A guy from France called Ariel Calma is also I never heard before. And so that makes me wonder that maybe there is like in the world some, which is very nice. Like I like that idea. There is some people not releasing nothing, just doing the music for the sake of it and never get released. So maybe there is even some more people like that, which uh, I hope. I and mean, I suppose it's, it's a slightly different thing, but it's not too far off what uh, Brian's, uh I've forgotten his surname, does with awesome tapes from Africa. You know, finding something that was very small, very local, maybe not even released, mm -hmm. and then picking out the best of this stuff and representing it back to the world. It's actually a, a kind of totally modern type of digging, isn't it? Yeah, and especially with an amount like this, and especially like the world is, is dead. And so, yeah, it's a very strange story, actually. Is there anything we can hear? Sure, sure. Okay. I skip the intro is a bit long. Let's keep it.
Ja. Wow, that's wild. And I also really like the, pro the you can, I can hear the, the, the process, he's doing the music, it's also mixed. This guy has, a, I think he learned the music in the kind of high school of music, but also keep <clears throat> some, like, a, the, you don't know, the concrete music, the, the, the way they, they do is the, the recording, I don't know, you, you, you throw my glasses on the floor and make some <laughs> noise, and, uh, and it mix all together with, uh, with the music, I think it's a big, mixture of, uh, of, of many things and uh, it's uh, very rare to, to see an artist on such a long period to use a lot of different gears but the music sounds him mm. and me that's my main thing to sign people for example on the label we, we are not so much is i like to see the person in the music i hear that's what, that's, that's what i like so you want the music to sound really individual unique like a like the person it's come from I think now's really the time to put it out to questions from you guys. You can ask whatever you want. If any of you have some questions, then uh, we can just spend a bit of time on that. Yes, where's the microphone? Hello, hi. Um, hi. So I just wanted to say for you, um, who's the most exciting uh, musician or DJ or producer to come from France at the moment? And uh, what's the most amazing song that they've made that you're really into? What's the main, sorry? Oh, sorry, that was two parts of the question. The first one, um, who's the most exciting musician, DJ, or producer to come from France or that is in France at the moment? And what's their best song? Yes, I'm very bad at that. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a very interesting label called Antinote. It's some, some, some young, young guys. Uh, um, so I would say yeah, this, this label, Antinote, as a, as a label. And... Uh, and for the rest, I think, it's, to me, it's all related. Like, uh, I really enjoy to go out and to play music for an audience. And I also really like to get in the studio and just kind of, kind of immersion and do music. But to me, it's, it's all very related. Like, uh, I, I like them all, basically, yeah. I also very appreciate, I, I first started to be a DJ before to be a producer. So I really like this energy exchange you can have with the people and I also really believe like uh, uh, you can drive people basically anywhere you want if you do it properly. That's why if you, some of them are DJ, I really push you to take risk and to, uh, and to play the music you like, like, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Is that a cough or a question? <laughs> So um, I find it really interesting uh, how versatile you obviously are as a DJ. Has this caused you problems, say, before your label became big? It, it can be a tough thing going to different clubs and playing such a wide range of music. Not that many people get away with it, Weatherall, Joel's Pizza, and a few people like that. Um, how difficult has that been for you? How what, sorry? How difficult. Honestly, I never ask the question myself. I just uh, release music I like and... And now we exist, next year is going to be 20 years. I never thought I would stay that long and I, and I never thought I would be thrilled that long. And so the labels, it's, it's an up and down. Sometimes we have some big tunes, sometimes it's a bit more low key, you know. So How about before the label? Before the label. Just going to DJ in clubs. Before the label, I was working in the radio station in Paris called Radio Nova. It's quite famous in Paris. But when I worked there, it, actually that's why I started the label. And I wanted, the idea was to start the label with them because I worked there for five years and uh, for some ego problem, it, uh, it never happened. So I received an iCube tape at the time at the station. And it was, yeah, so the tape basically has a kind of picture from a big building with like, a, well, a really big one, with like uh, maybe on the 30th floor uh, around saying like, yeah, I live here. And I listened to the music and basically it was, Incredible because the, the, that tape really reflected the idea of the label I had, which was versatile, basically. So they had some techno, they had some hip hop, there are even some trance and some stuff like that, you know. And uh, so, yeah, before I was working in that, in that station, and when I realized it was not going to be possible to, to do it, I asked Nicolas, yeah, well, I'm not going to stay uh, at the radio, I'm going to do the label by myself. Is that, is that okay for you? And then after I 
I've been to see the Daft Punk and they, they didn't make their first album at the time and we were a bit friend and uh, so I started my label. This is the first one, would you like to do a remix? And we did and, uh, and it was like huge at straight, which was really a, a big surprise. And then after I started that, I said, yeah, I put the, the level there and I have to, to keep on. Uh, so I tried to did, basically. Carrying on there. Um, were you playing in clubs before you played on Nova? Yes, I was. Um, yeah, so I'm in Nice, I'm from south of France, and when I was young, it was mainly rock clubs, and I was not so much at the time into rock stuff. And so we decided to make our own parties, and my brother has been to New York and took back a lot of hip hop records, uh, like the first De La Soul album, Third Base, it's really the early stuff. And so Everyone has to do something in the party, somewhere in the bar, somewhere in the entrance. And so as I was into music, so yeah, I will, I will play the music. And basically that's how I started to, to DJ. Yeah. DIY all the way. <laughs> okay, do we have any more questions? Okay, so we've got one at the back first and then one, at, oh, in fact, one at the front first and then we'll go to the back. Hi. Hi. Um, I, you were talking before about, um, this is a bit of a nerdy question. Um, um, you were talking before about um, using Ableton and how you feel that it hasn't quite got as much space when you're trying to do a mix down. I kind of thought this as well. Um, you say that you're sending a lot of stuff into your desk out of the box to try to do mix downs. Like, uh, can you talk a little bit more about that, about like exactly what kind of process you do? I, I say this because like all the IQ records are like the most spacious things. I've ever heard. Um, I, I want to know how it's done. <laughs> it's like a kind of back and forth be between uh, if you want like a, a delay or any effect to happen to a certain place of the arrangement with just like a simple like this, you can do it, you know, and that's really cool. And also, as I said before, to stick in front of a computer for hours and repeat stuff, I think you lose the kind of spontaneity of the music, at least the music I like to do. So that's why I, I combine together uh, a desk with some at least uh, eight outputs. And so I can make some fade, I can make some stuff. And then finally I record it to, into live with the effects. And then after I edit, or there is other option is to, as I said, also jam the track for a very long time. As group, for example, I have the, all the drums on one one bus, one channel, the bass, the scenes and stuff. And so while I'm jamming, I'm recording them in the computer. And then after that, I keep the spontaneity of the jam, but after I can go back to it and to edit it more, in a more production way, I would say. Thank you. Okay, question at the back. Um, there was this, uh, there's a quote from uh, Theo Parrish that really resonated with me about um, so this thing about um, you need to collect records for 10 years before you can really present them to other people in like a meaningful way as a DJ and um, kind of, you know, there's, a, there's, there's a, so much emphasis on, on newness and new artists and, and, and things like that. Um, given that your label has been going for such a long time, how would you say your taste has changed over that period? And um, how would, would you say it's for the better or for the worse? Definitely for the better. I mean, I think more your mind is open to music. I think to me, the best it is for yourself. And if you're producing or do any kind of artistic work, it's, 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 it's great. For example, when I started to make music, honestly, the, they, someone like David Bowie, for example, say, what the fuck with this guy? He doesn't touch me at all. Or like New Wave, I remember I was like uh, at school and I saw those people dressed in black. So, ah, ha, ha, ha. It looked very, uh, me, I was listening like funk and uh, jazz and mostly black stuff. So me, my evolution was very from the black stuff to, uh, I wouldn't say the white stuff, but uh, because to me it's all about <laughs> funk, basically. <laughs> uh, but yeah, definitely more sensible to some music I never thought I would, and it is because of the artist of the label, we are all constantly playing music one to another. Yeah, I discovered this, you heard that, and, uh, and that's also to keep on doing the label that keeps me very entertained, and I definitely need that. If I wouldn't have that, I would stop straight. Thanks. Okay, any 
any final questions coming in? Okay, then. In which case, please, let's say a very, very big thank you. Gilbert. Thank you.